Well, hello, and it's my pleasure to give this talk on the challenges to global access equity. My disclosures are as seen on this slide. Well, of course, up until the advent of vaccines, all we had available to us in order to manage the COVID-19 pandemic were these non-pharmaceutical interventions. PPE, masks, gloves, hand washing, physical distancing, regulated lockdowns, um, and of course, uh, watching our close contacts. The advent of a very welcome vaccine brings the following benefits. So provision of hopefully long lasting protection, delivery using existing health and other infrastructure with broad confidential access, overcoming social stigma, the need for behavior change and adherence, protection of all people at risk of infection, including those most vulnerable. And this is estimated in the case of COVID to be about 10 to 20% of the population. And then of course, this wonderful additional benefit of the potential for herd immunity. But here we need to get up to about 70 to 80% of the total population in order to derive that benefit. COVID-19s were developed and tested at breakneck speeds um, across the world and in, of course, involving multinational teams and extraordinary funding collaborations. So we do see a very, very healthy pipeline with uh, a number of vaccines now approved for full use, a number in an emergency approval status, um, and others coming up through the pipeline. A number of approaches have been used and you've heard about it in the symposium. We've got everything from passive immunity with antibodies, chimpad, uh, mRNA, DNA, and human adenovirus vectors. Um, and of course, here you see a list of those vaccines that have already made it onto the WHO line listing what their characteristics are in terms of doses and their needs from um, handling and logistics. More recently, our sense of euphoria has been a little bit dinged, if you like, by the recognition that this RNA virus, like many others, is able to mutate. And we have now well-described variants of concern, that is variants, uh, viral strains that uh, either are able to escape immunity or um, change the epidemiological characteristics uh, significantly, leading to quicker transmission, greater surges, um, and all of the difficulties associated with that. And of course, from a vaccine point of view, this means that we need to be considering whether the current vaccines are adequate, whether we will need boosting in the future, etc. But when we're contemplating vaccine access, um, as we described here in this perspective in the NEJM a month or two ago, uh, when we create a vaccine, we need stable long-term support of basic research and immunology. But when we deliver a vaccine, then we move to the issues of production capacity, supply chains, human resources, health infrastructures to deliver the vaccine safely, effectively and quickly. And whilst we've done the first extraordinarily well, it, it will be argued and I will cover in this talk that perhaps we have not done so well in the second. Indeed, 80% of the populations in low resource settings cannot expect to receive a vaccine this year. And this probably is due to long-term neglect of public health and global delivery strategies, which have left us poorly equipped to end this pandemic. So I hope today to look at this from a global level, a country level, at a population level, by socioeconomic status, and at uh, indeed an individual level. Vaccine equity has been defined as the equitable distribution of vaccines wor worldwide. And of course, I think we all do recognize that this is probably going to be essential in order to really see uh, a, a control of the global pandemic. So where are we with vaccine manufacturing? Well, these are the countries that uh, have production capability um, in terms of millions of doses and the US leads followed by India. 
And then the countries that have been dominating COVID-19 vaccine production here, China leads with US second, then Germany, India, and the United Kingdom. However, where are we in terms of COVID vaccine rollout status across the world? And as of June, happy to announce that we've had 2.6 billion doses administered, but the global map is stark in its lack of consistent um, penetration. So, and of course, this continent that I live on, uh, looking particularly pale and bleak in that regard. So how far have we come in achieving global access to vaccines? Well, clearly uh, North America leads here in terms of doses administered per 100 people, followed by Europe, um, and then quite far behind the rest of the countries and Africa really dismally lagging at 3.1 doses per 100 people. And in this description, um, and looking at uneven access to vaccines, looking at the most uh, wealthy to the least wealthy, you can see that the wealthiest 27 places in the world have 25% of the vaccinations and only 10.4% of the world's population are indeed the wealthiest. So we have this mismatch well described in the Bloomberg vaccine tracker. So what are the dimensions of an effective global COVID vaccine strategy? And described here in a paper by Olafir, in the Lancet, it is a matrix of development and production, affordability, allocation of those vaccines where needed, and then of deployment. And then mixed up within that deployment is obviously public confidence in vaccine and the ability to actually produce the arms into which the vaccine should go. When we look at each of the vaccines approved by the WHO at this stage, you can see their characteristics by development and production, by affordability, by allocation, and then finally by deployment. Um, and certainly you can see that uh, they do vary quite considerably across the various vaccines. In terms of affordability, we see prices all the way from $5 per course up to 62 US dollars. It's important at this point to talk about a global initiative to try to um, ensure better access to vaccines across the world. And uh, quite a lot has been said about COVAX. Their mantra is that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. Um, but it has been questioned whether the mission has in fact fallen somewhat short of, this, uh, of the goal. It was created to facilitate e equitable access. And the key uh, goal was to vaccinate the most vulnerable, 10 to 20% of the population of every country participating in the COVAX set up regardless of income level by the end of 2021. So a very um, blanket equitable approach. And they were hoping for 2 billion doses with proven safety and efficacy profiles to be distributed. So describing it in a little more detail, it is a joint initiative of various global health bodies, including Gavi and the WHO. Uh, these two primary functions to generate development of COVID-19 vaccines and then to ensure vaccine equity with 20% of the populations in countries as goal. Um, and Part of meeting the first uh, function was to incentivize the research and development of COVID-19 vaccines and neg negotiate the price paid for them, helping to secure a better deal by ne negotiating as a block. COVAX um, at the moment is supporting the development of nine vaccines in this way. So like many other global institutions, it's multilateral, it is charitable, it's dependent on alignment of powerful state interest, interests. Um, and it relies on the fact that equity will be ensured through self-financing states, being able to pay into the model and then drawing from it to secure vaccines for their population. Through funded states where official development assistance is used to support the COVAX advanced market commitment mechanism, 
And then for high income countries that participate in the scheme, COVAX was there to provide an insurance mechanism should their bilaterally agreed supplies fall short. But importantly, and probably most important, this has been for the low income countries where COVAX essentially is a vaccine lifeline when the prices of bilateral agreements become too high, or as might have happened with the pre-purchasing, there just simply hasn't been bandwidth to do this kind of bilateral negotiation. This raises uh, another whole area. This has uh, been very much uh, advocated for by the group called the People's Vaccine. Um, a number of organizations coming back to say, COVID vaccines need to be think of, thought of as a global good commodity. Um, and as such, the cost of medicines is seen as being the root problem of access to vaccines and technology. And so this campaign has been uh, started for a temporary suspension or a waiver of intellectual property rights protected under the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights or TRIPS Agreement of the World Trade Organization for all medical products required to fight during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here, South Africa and India played a role putting forward a proposal for a vaccine waiver. They were supported by other developing countries. However, unfortunately, as was seen, this was blocked by the EU, the US, the UK, Switzerland, and other high-income countries. In this uh, paper that was uh, published in the conversation, uh, it is argued that maybe the alternative, and it is controversial, that countries should think about issuing compulsory li licenses to produce their own vaccines, to set up bilateral agreements with those states that have production capacity, build vaccine blocks to negotiate and supply vaccines to territories, and to be prepared to disrupt power relations within supply chains by breaking confidentiality clauses in contracts and publishing what pharmaceutical companies want them to pay, or at least to leak those contracts. So moving uh, from the global picture, let me talk about equal access within countries. So who within a country is at risk of being left behind? And indeed, there are structural factors that may reduce access uh, within groups or populations. So that may include limitations in the logistics, such as the cold chain, inadequate access to vaccine distribution clinics, the digital divide, many vaccine programs have relied on the ability to get onto digital uh, systems, and there may be inequalities there, there may be limited appointments, um, the hours that vaccine centers are open, the need to come back for a second dose, if people are undocumented or Im immigrant, they may be excluded. And in some countries, due to licensing, uh, pregnant women may also be excluded. So systematic data collection and accurate reporting on vaccine uptake, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and other characteristics is really needed to assess population coverage. And I think we've become aware in the last few uh, months of inequity, even within countries, uh, where populations are not equally able to access vaccination. Here I uh, put forward South Africa as a case study where the public sector covers 85% of the population versus the rich private sector, which covers only 15% of the population. And there are inequities around people in the public or the private sector being able to access vaccines. Um, so again, raising the question, what can be done to ensure that people can equally access these, uh, these vaccines? What about prioritization of people on vaccine programs? And we know that prioritizing different categories of risk in healthcare sectors in South Africa is complicated by definitions of risk in personal and occupational contexts, and this applies around the world. The public-private divide that characterizes the South African health system adds complexity to this. Um, COVID-19 vaccine procurement is currently limited to South African government only leaving the private sector perhaps out on a limb. 
And in this paper by Moodley in the SMJ, she argues for fair distribution amongst tertiary, secondary, and primary levels of care. So how do we think about who gets the vaccine first um, and who has to wait? There are, is this important consideration of wastage. So it's been said within an emergency context, it's more important to inoculate a non-prioritized person than nobody. So at the end of a vaccine day, some doses are left over. It is much better to really move towards anybody who's available in a pragmatic, flexible way than to see vaccines wasted. There are some logistical considerations here, and we've actually have seen the wastage of vaccines due to expiry dates, due to a lack of ability to get vaccines to countries in time, um, and then needing to see them destroyed because of expiration dates. So again, here, raising the question of supply, demand, and availability. It has been raised that maybe children, because they're at low risk of severe COVID-19, should wait, um, and, and that in richer countries where children are now being vaccinated, is this fair when indeed there are countries where elderly have not had a, a single dose or their first dose. Um, this needs to be balanced around the fact that we are now becoming aware that even people who don't have severe disease may be subjected to long COVID. Um, we have to think about the risk benefit ratio of COVID versus potential side effects in vaccines. Um, and we are becoming more aware of those as, as time uh, accrues. Um, and of course, the importance that if we don't vaccinate children, yet they're not exposed to the disease, are we putting them at risk further down the line? Um, and can they contribute to herd immunity if they are not vaccinated? So all very important questions as we think about the greater international distribution of vaccines and who would benefit most um, in the global pandemic, not only in terms of reducing overall mortality, but also in, in stopping the transmission of the virus uh, overall. There has been this question, which does come into the, the question of equity, is if we uh, issue passports, does this further lead to difficulties for individuals who are unable to be vaccinated? So uh, on the pro side, vaccine passports become an incentive to get vaccinated, especially amongst young people. It's a systematic way of reopening parts of the economy, including tourism. But on the, on the con side, obviously this does start to very much raise the question of the haves and the have nots in terms of vaccination at a population level. And the question does raise whether this perpetuates an exclusionary uh, way of thinking Again, that those who have access to vaccines are in some way advantaged over those who do not. What do we then stand to gain from global vaccine equity? So on the health side, we definitely will reduce the global death toll. We'll reduce the emergence of new variants by vaccinating those most susceptible to infection. And we set a precedent for future global health endeavors. On the economic side, of course, we support we support global economic recovery. We mitigate supply chain interruptions. And on the social side, we strengthen global ties between countries, reject nationalist sentiments, and we uh, improve the reduction, well, we reduce the global health and economic inequalities that exist in the world today. Pleased to say, we are seeing some movement around this with G7 commitments around an additional 870 million doses to COVAX. Um, and uh, the call by WHO for multilateral development banks to release funding to help countries prepare to receive these vaccine. Um, and really quite a long way still to go in terms of the WHO estimation that 11 billion doses are needed to vaccinate the world to a level of 70%. Question is where these doses will come from and how we'll be able to do that without expanding 
manufacturing capability around the world. In that note, it was good to see in the news this week that the WHO is supporting South Africa to establish the first COVID mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub. Um, and this is something, again, that we argued in this perspective from the NEJ, is that we have to go beyond something like COVAX and think about other support that's needed, really having a long-term view. What are the institutional mechanisms? How do we support data and analytics for equitable distribution and workforce deployment? How do we prepare for future pandemics um, and also be able to address this notion of viral variants all at the same time? It does raise the question of the TRIPS um, and how we will explore and expand manufacturing capability, moving away from vaccines and medications being seen as a commodity rather than a public good, which serves to reinforce health and, any, and economic inequalities globally. And with that, I'll acknowledge those who helped me put this together, Ingrid Katz, who was the co-author on that NEJM article, the work of the People's Vaccine and other institutions such as the Health Justice Initiative. Thank you so much.